it's a, it's a pleasure to be in Strasbourg with you to discuss the issue of freedom of expression, disparagement of religious doctrines, and the ES judgment of the 25th of October 2018. The facts are fairly straightforward. Uh, the applicant who the court anonymized as ES was given giving several seminars from January 2008. In October 2009, she held two seminars at the Freedom Party Education Institute. While the court notes that the seminar was advertised to the general public, it also notes that the venue and the host were widely known for what the court labels as right-wing views. Therefore, it would have been no surprise to anyone attending the event that the opinions about Islam would very likely be critical. Um, this is evidenced by the fact that an undercover journalist was one of the 30 participants there, suspecting that there might be some controversial statements made worthy of reporting. The comments which the court uh, determined to disparage Mohammed, a figure which the Austrian domestic courts and later the ECHR held as worthy of reverence, uh, consisted of remarks which implied that because Mohammed consummated a relationship with a nine-year-old Aisha, whom he married at the age of six, that this meant that he was a pedophile. The lower court went to great lengths to assess the truth of the statements, even quoting the World Health Organization's definition of pedophilia as the gold standard of how that term should be used. In summary, the lower court found that the applicant was guilty of defaming a figure of religious veneration on the grounds that her comments were not academic enough and therefore should be considered as valued judgments rather than statements of fact and which were therefore unnecessarily disparaging of Muhammad. The lower court further held that because the seminar was open to the public, it could have led to religious disharmony. And finally, that because child marriages were common at the time, that Muhammad's actions could not have amounted to pedophilia. The fifth section of the court provided very little analysis or guidance in determining that the applicant's Article 10 rights were not interfered with by the criminal conviction. In essence, holding that the judgment fit within Austria's margin of appreciation and that the criminal fine was fairly moderate. Now, before discussing the ruling further, it's worth considering what hate speech actually is. As it seems nowadays we use the term a lot. Everyone is accusing everyone else of committing some act of hate speech. The fact is that no one really knows what hate speech is, and that's part of the problem. Hate speech appears to be just what anyone means it to be. Um, I would describe it, at a minimum, as weaponized political correctness with criminal effect. A fact sheet produced by the European Court of Human Rights admits that, and I quote, there is no universally accepted definition of hate speech, and a previous fact sheet observed that, and again I quote, the identification of expressions of hate speech is sometimes difficult because this kind of speech does not necessarily manifest itself through the expression of hatred or of emotions. It can be concealed in statements which at first glance may appear to be rational and normal. So according to the fact sheet intended to simplify and explain the law by the highest court in Europe, hate speech is A, without definition, B, difficult to identify, and C, can sometimes appear rational or normal. Now, is this really something we want to criminalize? In the fairly recent case of Bethlehem v. Sweden, the European court held that while the particular speech in question in that case did not directly recommend individuals to commit hateful acts, the comments were nevertheless serious and prejudicial. The court further stated, attacks on persons can be committed by insulting, holding up to ridicule, or slandering specific groups of the population that hate speech used in an irresponsible manner may not be worthy of protection. However, for decades, the court has held that freedom of expression constitutes one of the essential foundations of a democratic society, one of the basic conditions for its progress and for the development of every man. It is time and time again held that freedom of expression is applicable not only to information or ideas that are favorably received or regarded as inoffensive or as matters of indifference, but also to those that offend, shock, and disturb. And so I ask, who here in this room would be confident of placing certain ex expressions in the protected category on the basis that there is a fundamental right to use speech which offends and shocks and place other expressions in the criminal category on the basis that such speech may be serious and prejudicial. What is the difference between protected offensive and shocking speech on the one hand and criminal serious and prejudicial speech on the other hand? The answer again is no one knows. And it's increasingly clear that whichever group shouts the loudest 
gets to decide what is and what is not criminal speech. And that is bad for fundamental freedoms, bad for the principles of legal certainty, and bad for the rule of law. The result of such hate, such hate speech provisions is the reduction in the fundamental right to freedom of speech. Instead of being free to disagree with one another and have a robust discussion and a free exchange of ideas, hate speech laws, in fact, shut down the debate and create a heckler's veto. In the end, a chilling effect is created that leads to self-censorship and what we see today in Western culture, a very overly sensitive society. Let me be clear, the right to question whether or not Muhammad was a figure worthy of veneration should fall squarely within the realm of protected speech. Whether child marriages were commonplace at the time is absolutely irrelevant, I would argue. I would suggest that the whole notion that Muhammad is held up as a figure worthy of veneration means that as a matter of public debate, we can question his moral, his moral character. While others were indeed engaged in child bride marriages, none of those individuals are being held up as holy figures, and this is an important distinction. If Muhammad is being held out as a figure who should be emulated, we should be able to discuss all of his moral choices and hold him to a higher moral standard than others. The academic study of history demands as much. History points up a lot of unsavory facts about national and religious heroes all the time. American President Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Gandhi was well known for his adultery. Aristotle approved of pederasty. I think the marginal appreciation argument in this case fails on two grounds. First, Austria is a country of religious tolerance. The conflicts you see among different religious communities in other parts of Europe simply don't happen in Austria. So the idea that one seminar questioning the morality of Muhammad can seed religious discord, I think, is grossly exaggerated. I would say the restriction on the applicant's Article 10 rights was therefore not necessary in a democratic society. Second, I would suggest that there is a significant double standard being used by the Austrian courts in the application of Article 188. A case in point, uh, the famous Life Ball in Austria, which is an annual event raising money for HIV AIDS, um, a few years ago ran a very controversial billboard campaign around Vienna showing a nude transgender model with both male and female genitalia exposed. The backdrop of the photo was the Garden of Eden, and it made reference to Adam and Eve. So the story of the Garden of Eden is obviously a biblical event um, from the book of Genesis, held in common by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. The posters were in full view of everyone who passed them on the streets, including the religiously uh, sensitive and children. So I would suggest that these posters represented a far more egregious disparagement of religious doctrine in the way that they were incredibly graphic in nature and viewed by uh, literally potentially of millions of people than compared to the statements made to 30 people in a seminar whose target audience would have been supporters of the Freedom Party. It is this inconsistency, this self-selection of what is and what is not hate speech which makes hate speech such an insidious and controversial subject. And bad case law, particularly at the level of the European court, has consequences which are far-reaching. I would note that the Evening Standard, a national newspaper in the United Kingdom, has recently reported that girls as young as 10 are among hundreds of suspected forced marriages and honor crime victims in the city of London. I would therefore suggest that the ability to question or even disparage Muhammad for having a child bride, particularly when there is evidence that these types of forced relationships are still happen happening, is a matter of public debate. The fact that it was once common practice does not mean that it should not be the subject of public scrutiny today. Slavery was once common practice, yet we still criticize historical figures who own slaves. The Casey Review, a year-long study of community <coughs> cohesion in the United Kingdom undertaken by the Parliament, observed that, and I quote, too many public institutions, national and local, state and non-state, have gone so far as to accommodate diversity and freedom of expression that they have ignored or even condoned regressive, divisive, and harmful cultural and religious practices for fear of being branded racist or Islamophobic. Now, while the United Kingdom presents an interesting case study of its own in respect to hate speech because uh, increasingly censorship, particularly on university campuses and in the media, has been so prevalent, um, interestingly, the ES case would have been decided much differently within the United Kingdom. 
This is because of two important amendments added to the Public Order Act, those being Section 29J and Section 29JA, which allow for the criticism of other religions and religious figures, as well as speech related to sensitive sexual matters. The case of Redmond Bate, the Director of Public Prosecutions, dealt with the issue of street preachers and religious doctrines which may cause offense. Uh, Lord, Just Lord Justice Sedley, delivering the majority opinion, wisely noted that if the threat of disorder or violence was coming from passers-by who were taking the opportunity to react so as to cause trouble, then it is they, and not the preachers, who should be asked to desist and arrest it if they would not. This, I believe, is the proper standard. In a democratic society, we cannot censor speech simply because it may offend some and lead to disharmony. We've seen all too well with the censorship of cartoons depicting Muhammad that this is a slippery slope. If we are to censor speech which may trigger violence or discord among a certain radical segment of the population, then the question remains, how much of our freedoms are we to discard to appease a group of people whose sole aim is to remove our freedoms and destroy our culture? I think Justice Sedley provides a better response, that being that those who disproportionately respond to otherwise lawful activity or speech should be the ones punished for their activities. The problem we're finding, particularly in Western Europe, is not necessarily the criminal punishment of speech deemed to be offensive or hateful. It is that society has become far too oversensitive to certain forms of speech, critical of things like religion, sexual practice, or identity politics. And one of the big issues I have with this is it doesn't just stop at criminal speech. All of this is mutated into the areas of employment and academics. So we're seeing increasingly, particularly in countries like the UK, people losing their jobs because of something they put on Facebook, uh, people being removed from the university courses they've been deemed to, for example, not be worthy of being a social worker because of their views on certain moral behaviors. So this is the slippery slope with hate speech. The problem with imputing hateful motives or suggesting that truth is not uh, a defense, even if it's only a partial truth, is that it has a potential chilling effect on anyone making a statement which may attract controversy. This chilling effect could massively outweigh any public benefit to protecting some people from offense. The impact could be far-reaching and could severely stifle academic freedom, for example. The ES court goes to great pains to separate fact and value judgment. I would counter that by noting that the vast majority of academics, apart from math and some of the sciences, deals with value judgments. History, philosophy, psychology, sociology, and so on and so forth, all deal with value judgments being held out as facts. So to conclude, I will say that I think the court is on very shaky grounds with the EES judgment. I think this is a case of tremendous importance and one which should be taken up by the Grand Chamber. The lines of what is and what is not permissible speech have become far too blurred. And in the case of ESV Austria, the stakes are too high for the court not to address the issue. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Roger.